about the human rights violations in their classical sense. We are not talking about torture, although torture will continue. Whatever we do, uh, torture will never stop. Uh, torture has been going on until <coughs> recent days. Although it was proven to have been committed on a systematic scale in 2011 when Mr. Bissouni conducted his investigation. So it will continue. You cannot have tyranny without torture. You just cannot. You can't have a clean tyrant. A tyrant will always torture, will always prevent freedom of speech, will always have uh, arbitrary detention and all, sorts, uh, all other sorts of human rights. Today, the situation is both the human rights uh, tragedy and also the ethnic cleansing or even what I would say genocide. We ha I have talked some time ago about genocide, but of course it, uh, the word is too big. But if you go to the uh, United Nations um, uh, law, or genocide law, uh, Article 2, it, it tells you that when you, um, when you marginalize uh, a section of society to a, to, a, to a degree that will lead to their a gradual diminishing or uh, extin uh, extinction, then that amounts to genocide. It's all, not only by the physical killing and extermination of people, but also by uh, marginalizing them so much in all, and, and adopting policies that, but at the same time, we should not also just get carried away with political solutions that ensure at the end that it is meaningless. Even if they give you the best, the best uh, constitution, the best elections, uh, you have lost the game because you, have, you are no longer the natives of the people, of the country. The natives are the new generation, the new citizens are those who have been naturalized. So there it is a very, very serious situation that needs to be addressed by the opposition and by, of course, again, the human rights activists. The sectarian act on the Shia community, and this is need to be considered and kept in mind. Other than being detained and tortured, and electrocuted, and dragging people, sacking people from work, and so on, the next step was dissolving the Sharia Council. And then the third step, God help us, what's going to happen next? I want to hear. Uh, it's well known and it's just part and parcel of the report which is published by the Gulf Center for Democratic Development. There is a section about all these plans. It seems to me it is unbelievable. Every time I go and read this report, I find myself as if I am living a nightmare. Because it is well publicized, it's available, it is there, it's exposed, but nobody would like to take notice. Yes, as I said, as a human rights uh, campaigner myself, and as a uh, as survivor of torture myself, I know the importance and the critical uh, meaning of uh, raising the issue of human rights. But we are dealing here with unconventional case. Mm -hmm. It is not really part and parcel. I've been struggling in a high level advocacy. I met so many people from the uh, security uh, agency in UK up to America and the European Union. There is no definition in the international law which would allow anybody, because the issue of nationalization is the issue of sovereignty. And that's the tricky element of it. That's why I would like to take the issue of nationalization in Bahrain as a new phase in the international human rights mechanism protection. Because it seems to me now three, 360,000 uh, 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 applications were processed that means, in, anyway, I have a detailed figures here, I don't want really to bother you with it. A detailed makeup for the first time <coughs> in the history of Bahrain that the number of foreigners surpassed the indigenous <coughs> population, Shia or Sunni. That's a deliberate action by dissolving the majority of the community in an overwhelming presence of a selective Sunni uh, uh, migrant workers or expatriates. That's part of it, because there is a, a, some kind of a psychological warfare here. By, because the, the conflict is around the issues of identity and who controls the resources, full stop. It is no more than that. 
It is historically around the identity of the country. Who is in charge of it? Now, dissolving the uh, Majlis al ulamai uh, trying really to bring in a family law to, re to regulate how the Shia community is dealing with the communion of religious uh, uh, festivities, all these issues for me, to be honest, without uh, hesitation I say this, this is going to be irrelevant to the current conflict in Bahrain. That is why I find it very, sometimes, I'm a, I'm a keen observer. I love that country. I visited it first time in 1974. I have a family there living. I committed myself to the welfare of the being there. I never really came, although I'm assuming myself, I never really realized the issue of being within that. A deliberate strategy to build a sectarian apartheid in Bahrain. We said this so many times. Now, if we are talking about how these people now are challenging, even al Rufaq, the largest political group, which is going through a process for me, and I, I am a keen observer, I'm not here trying to insult any person, but I see it as a gradual co-optation, a strategy, to bring in the political forces within a, a playing field at a time when the rule of the game and everything is changed. So nowadays, now, when I look here to these figures, the number of the population, by 2020, the Shia community, at that time, Bahrain is going to be 1.6 million people. The Shia community is going to be 30%. Now, that's in 2020, just down the line. It's not that far. In, in, in the history of nations, five years is nothing, really. Now, today, in 2014, the number of the, of the Bahrain population, foreigners and indigenous, Unbelievable. Because in 2002, well, in fact, next March, the current uh, uh, King Hamad is going to uh, celebrate his 15th, 15th anniversary of being in power. When he came in 2004, the number of the Bahraini was 464,000. And the, uh, the foreigners, half of that. In almost less than 10 years, the overall profile of the population of Bahrain. Bear in mind that any uh, foreigners, any expatriates contributed for the last five or ten years, being part and parcel of any, showing any solidarity, showing, showing any uh, affiliation to the Shia, is going to be deported from the country without nobody. And the Sunni foreigners are encouraged to come. So nowadays, out of this 60%. The number of the overwhelming Sunni community, because that was a deliberate policy, is to encourage people from Sunni backgrounds to come into Bahrain and to relieve um, the, the Shia foreigners from their contracts if they are Arabs or Pakistani or from Asian background or Persian uh, background. I see this as enigmatic. I've talked to many people, I, I talked to experts on human rights organizations, I talked to people who's worked with group rights for years and years, and they said, this is a distinctive new era for us. It's it is not part and parcel, unfortunately I'm going to say this, it's not a part and parcel of any mechanism within the regional and international uh, mechanism of human rights. It is a Bahraini question. The advisors there, being foreigners or indigenous, being Bahraini or the rest of it, they are well aware of the international mechanism and they know. I raised this with the foreign office in this country so many times and said this is out of our jurisdiction. This is a sovereignty issue. To naturalize a person, that is a decision by a state. It is nothing for us to do or to ask. Now, I would really suggest for uh, the political forces in Bahrain, who is really keen now to find ways of dialogue with this regime. The regime is raising the issue of dialogue every time to buy time. Because he knows, on the ground, they are transforming the makeup of the demographic profile of the Bahrain. Now, if in 2014, we have 1.3 million population. By 2020, it's going to be 1.6 million, according to the projections. And I'm saying this is, this is an official figures. I'm not really making up these figures. This is official figures uh, published or kept by the authorities in Bahrain. Now, uh, this is serious. Yeah, this is, this, is, this is the situation. And maybe, maybe we can talk 
in a different session specifically about this. And we will bring specialists from international law to tell us how we will figure out this. In saying thank you to everybody for taking part in this meeting, mention one final uh, point that might be useful to consider. Uh, as you know, the king has recently increased the penalties for insulting himself. Uh, and uh, se severe sentences are imposed on people who tear up pictures of the king. So why don't we organize a demonstration in front of the Bahraini embassy in which a number of people would come with pictures of the king and they could march past tearing up the pictures as they go. That, that would, might, might be a good pictorial thing to, for us to do. Thank you very much for attending. And we are most grateful to everybody who has been here and taken part in this discussion, and particularly to our visiting speakers. Thank you to all of them. May we give them a round of applause.